coming to the stage right now and a good friend of mine. He is from San Francisco and uh, you see him regularly on The Tonight Show. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Mike Dugan. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, it's, uh, it's nice to be here. It's a pleasure to be here. I have had uh, a good day. I woke up early this morning, went birthday shopping for my nephew. He's going to be seven on Thursday. I had no idea what to get him, but I had to get him something because he's seven now and he has a memory. <laughs> I didn't know what to get him, so I thought, well, what would I have wanted when I was seven years old? I got him two things, actually. I got him a big bag of about 300 of those little green plastic army men <laughs> and a gallon of lighter fluid. Because you have to nurture children, that's so important. I, uh, I had a great childhood myself, I'm the youngest of five kids. If you're from a big family, you know that by the time parents get down to the youngest child, leniency has set in. They just say to hell with it, who cares, really? Well, what is your name again? Go do some work. Like my brother's the oldest, he'd get grounded for being 10 minutes late to dinner. By the time they got around to me, it was pretty much no heroin in the living room. Michael, you're not using one of the good spoons, are you? <laughs> I had a good childhood. I'm, I, I had a lot of potential when I was a kid. I know that. It said it on my report cards every six weeks. Michael has a lot of potential, but he won't apply himself. Sound familiar? Yeah, it happened to a lot of us. Do you figure the odds are somewhere a parent got their kid's report card home, opened it up, took a look at it? Your child has absolutely no potential whatsoever. <laughs> <laughs> We'd hold him back a year, but frankly, it's a waste of milk. <laughs> He's a doorstop with hair, is what he is. <laughs> I put my par I was a problem child. I put my parents through a lot, and I feel guilty now. Like I used to smoke a lot of pot in high school. I smoked, I smoked a lot. I smoked a lot. Of <laughs> the zigzag man had a tattoo of me on his arm. See, that's good. Now, sometimes I have to explain that to younger people. Well, you see, the zigzag man is kind of the Spuds McKenzie of the late 60s, early 70s. And my parents tried everything to get me to stop smoking pot. They screened my phone calls, sent me to a psychiatrist, everything you read about in the pamphlets. Finally, they stopped selling it to me. That seemed to work. <laughs> Teenagers shouldn't get high, though. You know why? Because they have no clue to begin with. That's why. Then they get stoned. They're just gone. I had this one friend in high school, every time he got stoned, he'd try to tell me these car crash stories with supernatural overtones. If you want to hear something really totally weird, man. My friend Jimmy left a party in his van. He was heading down the mountain to get some more beer. He went around the bend, missed the turn, went off into a thousand foot ravine. They didn't find his van for two days. Get this, dude. Stairway to Heaven was still playing on the tape deck. What a great Sears Die Hard commercial, huh? We took these seven drunk teenagers and put them in vans. Well, well that's good. You're a sick crowd, and I like that. You know, there's so much pressure on kids to drink these days, though. Look at these beer commercials on TV. Now I see the night belongs to Michelob. The night belongs to Michelob? Yeah, notice they lay no claims the following morning. <laughs> no, because the next morning belongs to Bear Aspirin, that's why. <laughs> the next morning belongs to Acme Towing and <laughs> Jacoby and Myers. <laughs> now, if you're gonna drink, have a good attitude. Of course, don't drive. But my roommate in college, Jim Kiley, heavy drinking 19 year old Irishman, he had a great attitude. He used to say, sure, drinking kills brain cells, but only the weak ones. <laughs> I, uh, I actually, I, I quit drinking. I stopped because I, I'm one of these people, I got the worst hangovers in the world. I couldn't even think the next day. 
I've got this theory. After years and years of careful research, I've come to the conclusion that not only does drinking kill brain cells, the ones that survive must spend the whole next day at the wake. <laughs> it's a disaster. I expect to see little brain cell newspaper headlines. Thousands perish as black Russians invade cerebellum. <laughs> Nervous system mourns eyelids at half-mast. Sources close to the optic nerve report sightings of an ugly stranger in bed. <laughs> Aspirin doesn't cure that, does it? No, you wake up with a case of the Onos, it's like, oh no. Oh, this isn't life in the fast lane, this is life in the oncoming lane. And speaking of aspirin, here's something that's puzzled me my entire life, perhaps you too. Do you ever wonder how medicine knows where to go in your body? How does it know? Like, you take aspirin for your headache, dones, pills for your back. What, do they stop at a gas station, ask directions? What if I take a Midol? This stuff running through my veins. Excuse me, could you help me out? I am really, really lost. Thanks a lot. Good night. Thank you all very much.